My name is Jan Polanski, I'm from Tel Aviv University. And this end of lecture is supposed to give you kind of an introductory uh, course to dark matter physics. And you'll be surprised how much there is to say about something you know nothing about. Uh, in fact, nine hours is not going to be enough, of course. So what I prepared is something uh, quite introductory uh, and more than I can probably say in the set of six lectures. Which means that um, if you feel that I'm going too fast, please uh, uh, stop me, ask as many questions as you want. Uh, I'm part of that, and if you think that I'm going to slow, of course you can tell me that too. Um, so, regarding uh, the exam, so I also have all kinds of exercises that I'll give you along the way that I think are useful in order to kind of follow what I'm, I'm uh, uh, trying to tell you, and um, how much of them you need to hand in in order to uh, to get the exam, I don't want to be the bad guy, so I let the organizer decide what percentage of the exercises that I write down are now for the exam. But uh, I write them down as we go along. Okay, so let me start before telling you the exact plan and why this is the plan of the course. Let me start with a, a short introduction. Um, so we know uh, that what we all around us, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you in a second why, how we know this, or why we think this is, uh, this is true. Uh, but let me start with some basic, basic facts that you know I can uh, tell my friends even when they're not done, uh, and they will see this. So what do we know about that matter? Um, so the first thing is that it is composed of roughly 85 percent of that matter. 85% of matter in the universe. Um, we know it is non baryonic. We know it is cold and slow. Okay? And um, we know it is stable on cosmological time scales. Is this big enough, by the way, or should I write it uh, bigger? A little bit bigger, sorry, okay. I'll try. If, if it shrinks again, it's a num, just let me know. Uh, right, and of course it's neutral. <laughs> and we also know uh, additional facts, like we think we know roughly what is the uh, density around us in our local neighborhood? We think this is the rough density. If I have time, I might uh, say to you why we think that. Uh, we also uh, think we know the flux of that matter that goes through us. So there's a flux of that matter, which is roughly 10 to the 7 particles uh, uh, per second. And again, this is a very rough matter for the specific kind of mass of the dark matter and so on. We'll go into that later on. But these are the kind of facts, some of them uh, uh, we know and we are quite confident about, some of them we don't. And the, the goal of the course here is really to kind of uh, walk it through uh, what we know and what we don't know, and when we say something, what kind of assumptions uh, we, are, we are making when we make statements. Okay. Uh, so how do we know the, uh, the dark matter? Well, there are, there are quite a few scales, uh, starting from, from a galactic scale of the 10 kiloparsecs or so, to uh, galactic clusters and, uh, and superclusters, where we actually know that, and see evidence for dark matter. So let me, rather briefly, kind of tell you what are the uh, what is the evidence for dark matter. So I guess the first um, the first evidence uh, were were found by Vicky uh, in the early thirties. Uh, this is in the coma class here. So 
So it's a, a galaxy cluster. And what was done was to look at the velocity of the different galaxies in the cluster, in the cluster of galaxies, and using the viral theory. Okay, so we have, you know, using viral theory. So, 2 k minus the velocity, the, the potential. Okay, so if we have uh, roughly the mass, the kinetic energy, and we measure the average velocity of these uh, 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 galaxies, we can estimate that's roughly g newton times m over r, roughly the size of the cluster and the mass, and we can extract the mass, what, what we did was to extract the mass of this cluster using the measurement of this velocity, of the average velocity, and then um, extract chain, comparing that to the mass that we see in the cluster from light, and there was a big discrepancy So big discrepancy of factor of 400, roughly. So when you did that, when you looked at the Kovacara cluster, you found that you're missing mass of order 400 of what you expect. Okay? There needs to be more mass from this measurement compared to what you see from that. Okay? So that was the first uh, kind of evidence that it took quite a few more years for people to get convinced, and the next uh, big step was done by Rubin in the uh, late 60s. And this is the rotation curve. So, this is a different, uh, different uh, uh, scale. This is a, a galaxy cluster, you know, galaxies. And what you do is you measure the velocity of yes, a galaxy and, and you measure the velocity of stars that are rotating around the galactic center and then you move, you move uh, further out because most of the mass is in the galactic center. If you move further out away from the galactic center, you expect that the velocity drops because of the uh, potential. The, the, uh, the uh, gravitational potential can be weaker. Okay, so basically, uh, it, it's pretty simple to expect that n, the velocity uh, of, the, of the rotating star is supposed to go like uh, just Newton's law. Okay? And that tells you that the velocity. Go like one over the square root of the radius. If the mass is constant, so if you are sufficiently away from the galactic center, most of the mass is here, most of the mass that we see is here. So that means that n should be called constant around here, and therefore the velocity should go like one over the radius, the square root of the radius. So if we plot this, Draw the velocity as a function of r, close to the center of course, it grows and then it starts falling, and this goes like one of the square root of r. Okay. That was the expectation, that's not what uh, was measured. What was measured is this. This is the measured value, this is the measured value. Assuming it's constant over here, it's really not constant. The mass here should be proportional to r. 
Okay? So that's the conclusion. And since the mass is just the integral of the R of the density, okay? So by the R squared times the density. This tells you that the density should go like 1 over r squared, but it should continue all the way, all the way outside the galactic center. We see all the mass here, but gravitationally what we detect is that there's much more mass than those that extends far away from the galactic center. Okay. These are the rotation curves. This is a, a, a surprising it kind of indicates that we are missing mass, we have some dark matter, some halo, it can spread very out of the center. Okay. <coughs> so the next thing that we have uh, evidence for, uh, uh, we use lensing. The gravitational energy. And one a really interesting a, a, a piece of evidence for that matter is the so called bullet cluster. And the bullet cluster is the following we see a snapshot of two clusters of galaxies that collide. So, how do we see that? There are a, a, Several ways that we can uh, look at these classes, uh, class of galaxies. So, first thing is to look at the optical lens, just optical uh, uh, light. And we see just a bunch of stars here and a bunch of star, uh, galaxies over right here. And, but this is not so this is from light. So, three ways. So one of them is just the uh, optical. By the way, is this already big enough or should I write it in? Feel free to let me know. Okay, so we measure, we look at the optical uh, spectrum and we see some uh, galaxies some density of galaxies. However, most of the uh, regular matter is not inside these galaxies, it's in the gas that is in between the galaxies. Okay? So the second thing to look to do is to look at X-rays. And when you look at the X-rays, you see that uh, indeed most of the matter is there, most of the uh, regular matter is there, luminous matter. And, um, and so we see some kind of uh, density here, and in fact you see a bullet time <coughs> shape, so you see some kind of uh, uh, density around here. Okay? And the interpretation is that we have some galaxy cluster here, another galaxy that went through, a smaller galaxy cluster that went through it, and there's a short wave that we can see, and, and uh, this is just a snapshot of what happened when they collide. However, this is not the whole story because most of the mass, not just the luminous mass, most of the mass of these clusters is found by looking at gravitational lensing, deep lensing. And when we look at the uh, uh, use gravitational lensing to see where is most of the mass, we find that really the picture is something like that. The center of the, of the Mass that we find from gravitational lensing. Of course, for gravitational lensing, we don't need to see the material, the matter. We just see its gravitational effect on light that comes from behind it. And uh, the center of the mass that is obtained with gravitational lensing is displaced away from the center, the region when we see the X-ray. So this would be the X-ray, but the center would be something here. Another interpretation is that uh, these two clusters collided, but you see that uh, the matter 
when it collided, when it went through one another, because they interact, they kind of slow down by that pattern, which doesn't interact, or at least weakly interacts with itself, went through one another, and so we have a much larger, so the, the uh, displacement of the dark matter inside the cluster is further out. So it went, it went through one another while regular matter slowed down. Okay? So this is kind of evidence that something is going on, we have some additional matter. If before with the rotation curve we could think that we should say change uh, just a uh, Newton's law, uh, there are theories like that which I won't talk about, it's called non modified Newtonian dynamics. If we think that this could explain uh, the rotation curves, here it's much harder to explain it with this kind of theory because the displacement, the, the, the center of the, uh, of the weak lensing and the x rays are expected in this kind of theories to be the same, but they are displaced. So, this kind of uh, evidence is another, if you want, strong evidence that uh, there is that matter. Now there's more, uh, there are more studies used uh, uh, micro lensing. So for instance, you could think that uh, a lot of the matter that we're missing is just in regular baryonic matter that is uh, just non luminous. These are called machos. Uh, and uh, micro lensing, so ma 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 massive astrophysical uh, compact halo objects. Machos, so micro lensing is about here. Micro lensing uh, exclude machos. To a good, to a good uh, degree of accuracy, we know that machos, these non luminous baryonic stars, if you want, uh, cannot provide the full explanation because we look in our galaxy, and we uh, ask how many of those uh, to be find using micro lensing, again, without looking for the uh, light, but rather for the computational effect, and we find that they don't explain that. Okay, so I'm not going into the details of which experiments, but uh, there are quite a few that have done this. Quite a few uh, astrophysical surveys that have done this, and we know that this is not the case. Okay. So, um, so again, language was that was, was uh, good for uh, the class scale and also the galactic scale in the case of Marshall. Next piece of evidence is CMB. So we all know about the cosmic uh, microwave background and um, this the piece of evidence, this is line that comes from the uh, earliest time of the universe where the light was free to propagate, at the time of recombination, when atoms became uh, uh, neutral. And I'm sure you've all seen this kind of, of plot where we look at the uh, spectrum from the CMB, the fluctuations. So everyone has heard about the cosmic microwave background. Right? Okay, so you know that it's a it's, uh, homogeneous and isotropic and travel the same temperature everywhere, but the R fluctuation, the B fluctuations are being studied, they give you they give us a lot of information about what happened in the time of recombination. And these acoustic peaks that we measure strongly depend on the type of matter that uh, that collapse gravitationally collapsed because regular matter also feels the pressure from photonic pressure. So it, it kind of tends to erase these kind of uh, uh, acoustic peaks, this, this, um, co this collapse, and uh, that matter just collapses, it doesn't do much more. So that matter, the amount of that matter kind of changes the peaks, the size and location of the peaks, uh, of these acoustic, uh, acoustic uh, peaks. And so CMB data, together with the additional astrophysical and the uh, the, the galactic spectrum and so on, gives us a lot of information and what we find is that all in all, uh, let, me, let me write it down, omega b h squared, that's from fitting to the CMB data, uh, is squared, 
squared is the baryonic rate density is this, while the dark matter, cold dark matter rate density is this. Okay? So when we do a global fit and we ask how much a baryonic that matter, sorry, baryonic matter there is. So this is, you know, omega so omega i is the matter density of species divided by the critical mass density, uh, the density that is required for the flat surface, and, and we find that there must be, so this is consistent, it's only consistent if there is a large fraction of that matter uh, that affects these acoustic peaks, or if you want to affect the fluctuation at the time of the ventilation. Okay. Final evidence is, is really a PBN, well, there's more, but the one that I want to mention uh, is PBN, Big Bang Nuclear Synthesis. So, Big Bang Nuclear Synthesis uh, uh, discusses or deals with the production of light elements. In the other universe, uh, so helium, hydrogen, hydrogen, helium, uh, deuterium, lithium, and so on. And of course, the amount of uh, the, the density that we see today of these light elements strongly depend, depends on the so called the amount of barriers that we have, the number of protons, if you want, the neutrons. And this is just the number density of barriers divided by the number density. Photon, and that's the number of roughly six times ten to the minus ten. If I mention less number, it's roughly six times ten to the minus ten. And so, of course, the number amount of helium and the amount of lithium and so on depends on how many protons we have, and the amount of the number of protons probably depends on how many baryons. These are the number of baryons, protons and neutrons. And so, it's not a surprise that the light element, the synthesis of light elements, depends. Of the number of variables that we find that it's completely consistent with this number. So I'm not going to write it again, but these measurements uh, are consistent with the CMB measurements that we are on the cosmological scale need to have much less variables than we do uh, uh, of matter, roughly a factor of five. So I, I, I'm rushing through the evidence because I think that the most uh, important part here is just today the, um, is the following. We have evidence from all kinds of scales, from uh, galactic to, to uh, the whole side of our universe, and uh, that there is something going on, we're missing just regular matter. Uh, and the interesting part about dark matter is now that it's uh, uh, so this is not the interesting part of dark matter itself uh, is an extremely extremely simple solution that solves all these problems. Just an additional particle that interacts uh, uh, gravitationally without nothing more than that, at least in order. And yet it explains all these anomalies at all scales of our universe. And this is why it's so convincing. That uh, it really is uh, dark matter. Okay, so any questions? So the evidence that it's called is low, or it comes from the CMB? No, 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 no. So we'll get to that, of course. Uh, it also it comes from structure formation. So when you have a dark matter that is cast, it kind of tends to erase the scale and erase any fluctuation. So it, it doesn't allow for a large or small scale uh, structure to form depending on its, its so called free streaming. So there's a limit, there's a, a bound of the free streaming of particles, and that's related directly to whether it's hot or cold. So, and, and that's why we know that it's hot. But I, I hope we have time to talk about it a little bit more. Okay. okay. So now the question is, you know, what, what, so we convince ourselves that there is a matter of how do we, how do we approach this, how do we uh, uh, think about it in an organized way, 
And what are the parameters? What is it? Is this? What kind of parameters I'm trying to explain? So, and there are quite a few parameters that we would like to try and explain and that are related to our experimental uh, uh, ways to try and probe that matter. So, this is first a motivated class. Uh, it's an elation cross section. We'll understand soon why annihilation cross section, the rate of dark matter annihilating into something else. Why is this important? It has, we have its cross section itself, so self interaction. We have its density in our galaxy. So this is the density as a function of the uh, location in our galaxy. We want to know what this is. We want to know what is cross section. So for me, chi is going to be dark matter most of the time. So whenever I find chi, I mean dark matter. So what is its uh, interaction with nucleons, like a proton? What is its interaction rate with electrons, and so on and so forth? So we have set quite a few parameters that we'd like to uh, uh, figure out. And in any given model, we could just you know, write it down if you want randomly. So we need an organizing principle. And there are two, at least two ways of trying to organize this. So one of them is kind of taxonomize the theories of dark matter according to the production mechanism. Or according to this mediation mechanism, namely, how does it interact with us? So if we want to learn about that matter, either we need to explain uh, how do we obtain this density that I wrote here. Whatever theory of that matter we're going to write down, we better explain this number. And the simpler the explanation is the better. And Whatever more of that matter, if you want to be convinced that it's the right answer, we better be able to probe it. It could be that we can't. But one way of thinking about the different models is by studying the mediation. How do they, how do they couple to us? Do they have light mediators, heavy mediators? What kind of interactions are they with the kind of model with the visible signal? Okay. I'm not going to be able to have time at all to discuss the mediation. Uh, the way to think about it in an organized way uh, for mediation. But what I will start with is kind of taxonomizing models of that matter according to the production mechanism. So the rest of these uh, talks are going to be organized as follows. So the plan. On the next, at least, uh, two lectures, we're going to talk about the production mechanism. Then I'm going to discuss how we try to probe that model. So, probes. And only at the very end, probably only in the last lecture, uh, we will talk about models of that model. Each of these can, can, can last for the whole six lectures. Of course, models of dark matter, there are many, many models of dark matter, and this is intentional, but I'll be only be speaking about a, a few and very shortly. And the reason is that I, I don't want you to be uh, biased. I think we, like I tried to argue, we, were, we have been biased uh, for a long, long time now in how we think about dark matter. Uh, specifically, we've been thinking about the wings uh, over and over again in. Uh, in all aspects, how we detect it, and how, and what kind of models, and why do we think this is the most motivated theory? I will talk about it now. But you guys are young, and you should think uh, very critically about this whole uh, topic. So, what I want you to kind of uh, take take away are uh, what we think we know and what are the assumptions that we make, and uh, how we try and learn about that, that matter. Coming up with models of dark matter is easy, and I hope that when you have these tools, it will be very easy for you guys to just approach 
different type of models that are going to be cover for new models. Okay, so that's the plan for the rest of the of the lectures. Okay, so let's let's start with the uh, So probably the most um, known way to produce that matter, the most attractive way to produce that matter, is the so-called free time. So what is the idea of free time? Freeout is a mechanism that is completely independent of initial condition. To understand it, just imagine that you have some box, and in this box you put some two types of gases, some, some thermal bath of type A, this would be a, a photon, a standard model. And now we put in some additional type of gas, that, that's dark matter, uh, uh, called type B, and we turn on a small, tiny interaction between <laughs> Tie between gas A and gas B, and we just wait. So we have some kind of interaction that's very roughly, we have this diagram saying from photon type A, I'm sorry, this is type A, and this is type B, and they interact with each other. If we wait a long time, no matter how small this interaction is, if we wait a lot, long enough, they will equilibrate and thermalize, and both A and B will be in thermal equilibrium following you know, the Boltzmann distribution or whatever it is. Now start dialing down the temperature. If we, if, as we drop the temperature below the mass of a, a particle B, then it will still follow the thermal equilibrium, but we know that it will follow Boltzmann, Boltzmann distribution. So the number density is going to be proportional to E over the energy, which is now the mass, because, the, because this is a non-relativistic, the temperature is below the its mass over the temperature. So the number density of B is, is going to be exponentially small. Why is it going to be exponentially small? Because now this direction is going to go through. B particles will find each other, they will annihilate into type A, but type A will now, because the temperature is low, that don't, don't have enough energy to produce B particles. So this will slowly annihilate, and therefore the number density will drop exponentially as we dial down the temperature. Okay? That's what that's what's gonna happen in our box. Our box is not really best Okay. Now what happens if we uh, let this box expand, like our universe? If you let the box expand, now, at some point, the particle B will have a hard time finding his partner in order to annihilate. So what is the condition for this? The condition, hard time, what we mean is that they will not have enough time compared to the rate of expansion. So the rate of annihilation, the rate of these processes going in this direction, is slow compared to the rate of expansion of our box. So if we let our box expand and we still dial down the temperature, we're going to see that uh, at first it's still going to go exponentially, the uh, number density will be exponentially small, but at some point, particles number B will not have enough time, will not be able to find particles, and they will just freeze out. They will just, uh, the, number, the number density will not change because they will no longer be there. Okay. That's the picture of freeze out. What does the number density eventually depend on? So what, what we said it in a second ago, but what, what is the parameter, the only parameter we care about in order to figure out how much of these particles are going to be left when we let this box expand? Cross section. The cross section. The only thing is just the cross section of these particles going into the A particle. Right? If, if the cross section is huge, they will, the rate will be fast, much faster than the expansion, and therefore they will maintain equilibrium. If it's not, then they will drop out of equilibrium. 
Okay, so that's the idea. Now let's do it uh, more mathematically. Try to figure out what's going on. Okay, so let's make the following assumption in order to uh, work our way through freeze out. We're going to make several assumptions. <clears throat> okay. So there are three assumptions. First is that that matter is stable on cosmological time scales. It's obvious if it's not, then it would get punished before we see it, and we wouldn't see it today. The second is that, um, okay, is that it, it is in thermal equilibrium in the early universe. Thermal equilibrium. In particular, we know that we have a phase of inflation, so what we really mean is that, in particular, the really temperature after inflation, when it really hits the, the, the center, it will be larger than the mass of the dark matter. Okay? Otherwise, we never produce dark matter at all, and there's no point of discussing this. So that's the second assumption we made. <laughs> and the third assumption is that we just were going to go through this process that I just mentioned, but after we do, we don't care, we don't want to think again about what's going on in the in cosmology. Maybe there is no late time dilution after freeze out. Once star matter flows out, its number density is constant. Up to the volume, of course, it, it, it goes down because the universe continues to expand. But nothing else changes, then we don't have some uh, something that dilutes the number density further once it flows out. So that's a third assumption that we make about the cosmology of such a body. Okay. So how do we describe this process? So, generally the process of, uh, of uh, non-equilibrium dynamics, thermal equilibrium dynamics, in the universe is described by the Boltzmann equations. <coughs> that uh, describe the evolution of the phase space density phase space density of some particle and which we call F which is a function of B mu and X mu and the words on equations are just the equations that describe the evolution of the phase space, the probability to find a particle on a given P moment on a given X, uh, out of equilibrium, when it's not maintained, it's done maintained to equilibrium. Okay. So how many of you have seen the words on equations? Alright, so let me walk you through them a little bit. So, formally we can write it like that. There is some Leoville, so called Leoville operator, which depends on F, equals to some collision operator, which depends on F. So, this is the Boltzmann uh, equation, and for a uh, spatially homogeneous. Homogeneous and isotropic, 
partially homogeneous in the isotropic uh, uh, universe, we can write down f equals f of absolute value p and time, which is f if you want of the energy and time. Okay, we, don't, we don't care about the direction of the x, partially homogeneous in the isotropic. And then the new V operator takes the following form, it gives just E time T F of time minus H E time squared D E F. Okay? So that's the new V operator for a special homogeneous in the Conversely, the uh, collision operator just describes the interaction of whatever this particle is going through with whatever additional particles we have. So we would draw this equation for every single particle. Okay, so we would write a, a Boltzmann equation for every. This would be a set of coupled equations for every particle that was in that's a phase space factor, a phase space uh, function, and the um, density. And we arrive, we would write a single one equation for each such particle. Okay, so what are the collisions? It's, it's pretty simple, minus one half integral of d pi. By the way, I totally forgot to say, before, the very beginning I wrote a set of um, uh, references for reviews of that matter. I can, I can write it again if I just forgot to say, to mention it. None of these reviews are um, complete. None of these would take it through all of the subject, of course. So if you remind me uh, once in a while, I invite additional uh, references that are relevant. And this is particular, just learning about the Hoffman equation, the problem that I come out of the book. Okay, so if we have some interaction, say, chi with A with particles A, B, C, and so on, going into I, J, K, and so on, some set of particles in chi involved going with another set of particles, then the collision is just the integral of the phase space of all particles other than time. Okay. Time, of course, is then 2 pi to the fourth, then the fourth <coughs> of the momenta, p chi plus p a. So minus pi minus pj and so on. Okay. Times the matrix element of chi and b going to i, j, k times the phase space factor, which is fa, f chi, sorry, fa, and so on, times 1 plus minus k. I one okay. So that's the interaction described of chi A B going into I J K. And of course it depends on the form of the phase space, the number density if you want, the phase space factors of how many chi we have, how many A's we have for a given moment with a given momentum, and with a given energy, times the, the form factor for production, okay? Minus the matrix element for exactly the opposite uh, process of R, J, K, and so on going to A, B, C. And again, here, I have F, I, F, J, times 1 plus or minus F, I, 1 plus or minus F, A, plus or minus uh, for the Bose Einstein versus the Mickey Brock. Distributions of whether these are bosons or fermions. So, this is for fermion, this is just a blocking factor. F cannot be larger than 1, otherwise, this is 0. This is just a, 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 a statement about fermions. And in most part, we will just ignore this factor and assume that all of these particles have density which is small to 1, and then we can ignore this. And, it, and then this equation becomes pretty simple, we can just ignore these terms. 
and we have the matrix element of chi chi AB going to one JK, time is the uh, phase based factor for chi AB, minus the opposite direction, the reaction in the opposite direction times the final phase. Okay. Oh, I should say what the what you buy is so what the phase based factor. The phase phase based factor just the degree of freedom, number of degrees of freedom of particle I times one over two pi cubed times D three P over two pi. Okay. All right. So, how do we proceed? This looks like a kind of a complicated equation, but we can simplify it greatly. And the easiest way to do that in relevant situations, like uh, this freeze out, is to go and discuss the number density. So, the number density here in my field of power is just g over 2 pi cubed times the integral over the phase space. So this is just the number density. We can integrate, we have this on the left hand side and this on the right hand side, and we can integrate this equation. So if we integrate it, we integrate over g over 2 pi cubed integral of 1 over d tan d3 d tan. Okay, so I, I remind you again that here we have we integrate over all phase space of all particles except the chi particle. Now we just integrate the left and right hand side. So this is now symmetric. The, the factor of two here times this is just this d pi chi. And on the left hand side we need to integrate two. Okay. So What do we do? What do we get when we do that? So when you do that, you integrate, you get dt of n plus 3h n of chi equals minus sigma v times n chi squared minus n chi. Equilibrium squared. Well, the thermally average cross section is defined to be the following it is 1 over n equilibrium and chi equilibrium squared times integral of uh, d pi, now I mean all of the pi's, times. 2 pi to the 4, delta to the 4 of whatever we have, the full delta function, times the matrix element of chi chi. Now I'm talking specifically about annihilations, chi chi and the standard model, standard model. Times the phase phase factor that we plug in here which I'm assuming for now is just the Boltzmann distribution. So there is time, some phase phase factor, which is e to the minus e chi 1 plus e chi 2 over t. Why e chi 1 plus e chi 2? You, remember, you have to remember that when we, I mean, look, look at this equation here, we would have, you see, this is chi chi going to standard model, standard model, we would have f chi, f chi. This is not just f chi squared, you have to remember that this chi comes with one energy and this second chi comes with another energy. And this is what shows up here in the Boltzmann uh, distribution. Okay? Okay. And the number density, now the uh, equilibrium number density is easy to, uh, to perform, so let me tell you what the answer is. So the integral. 
for n is equal to the fault of n equilibrium. n equilibrium is just g over 2 pi cubed times integral dcp of e to the minus g over t. Again, I'm assuming both fun, and then equals g over 2 pi squared and chi squared times temperature times a basic function of m over t, which you can show is just g 1 over pi squared t cubed for t much larger than n chi, and it is just the Boltzmann unit n t over 2 pi to the 3 halves t to the minus m over t when t is much smaller than the mass. Okay? So this is the equilibrium value of the number density for kite. Say, this is the equilibrium value. It, it maintains two limits. One when the temperature is very high, it just goes like the temperature Q, just the invention and analysis. And one when it goes uh, when it's very low and it's exponentially small, as we mentioned before. Okay? Okay, so exercise number one. So we are jump a few steps here. So derive the Boltzmann equation for n. So just let's start with what we did and, and just put in the gap that I that I had here. Then derive the same Boltzmann equation for rho, which is just g over 2 pi cubed times this should be as e f of e and g. Okay? So this is the average energy density rather than the average number density. <clears throat> and then explain the coefficient in front of the Hubble, right? By the way, I never mentioned what this Hubble is. Do everyone know what, what this is? I'm sorry. Has everyone done cosmology, basic cosmology here? Who, who has? I won't ask who has. Okay, then I'll define each in a second. But explain this coefficient, three. And, um, okay. I have another question, but we'll skip it now. Okay, so in an expanding homogeneous isotropic universe, I don't have time to go over all the cosmology, but the Hubble rate is just the scale factor, the acceleration of the scale factor. And there is one equation which you need to know, which is derived from the Einstein equation. Uh, and this is the Friedman equation, which means that um, h bar. A squared, I'm sorry, equals a pi g newton over three times the energy density. And if you actually do this integral and find out what the energy density, well, it doesn't matter. But it just we call that the energy density it goes like some yeah, time like e to the fourth. Okay. So this is h. And it explains, this is the one scale which explains the rate of expansion in the universe. It's h dot over h, it's the rate of expansion of the universe we will see in a moment. Well, until what time do they have? We go to one. To one, okay. So we will see in a moment <coughs> that uh, when we want to compare, to understand, we said that we want to compare the rate of annihilation compared to the half of the rate of expansion. This is the rate of expansion. Okay, so this is the half one. Okay. Questions? Is this too fast, too slow? You should, you should really slow me down if you feel that I'm going really too fast. And just ask questions. Feel free to ask any. 
Any problem? All right. So let's try and understand this equation. Actually, pretty simple. This term is a term that tells us that the universe is expanding. Without this term, we would be in a static universe. And this term is just a dilution of the number density because of the expansion. So if there were no interaction, if the light inside was zero, there were no interactions, n would just uh, dilute because of the volume. And this is the term that tells you this, so n really without interaction goes like a to the minus 3. That's the solution. That's the uh, 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 implication of this question. Okay. Again, given some fairly average cross section, this term is just, this time the uh, thermal average cross section is the rate per unit volume of interaction of chi squared going into standard model. And this term is the opposite going of the standard model. So the two particles in the standard model going back into going interacting and creating chi particles. That one, that one. Okay, so we have the annihilation, the back reaction, and this is what we're Okay. So to make a little bit uh, more progress, it's kind of useful to uh, write this equation a little bit differently. So if we do, if we ignore this term, we should know that this, again, is just a statement that number density drops like the volume, because it's a density. And the exact same thing happens for the entropy. So in our, our universe is expanding uh, adiabatically, which means the d of a cube times the entropy density is zero. Okay? So if I do that, I get that uh, if you want dt. I get that uh, 3 a dot over a times a cubed s plus a cubed dt s equals zero. That's just a derivation. And this is precisely what we have here. So dt of s, I'm rewriting it like this, plus 3hs equals 0. So if you want to get rid of this term, if you want to ignore the expansion due to the volume, sorry, ignore the change in the number density due to the volume expansion, the change in the volume, it's very advantageous to look at a uh, so called y, which is n times normalized to the entropy. The entropy density. This is a dimensionless like, parameter that we're going to use. The other parameter, the other change, is to define z, our time parameter, because the Friedman equation that I just wrote, let me write it one more time. So, for those of you who have never seen anything, any, and took any course or, or read any, anything about, uh, Cosmology and the expansion of the universe. Uh, Corbin Turner was, was, a, was a simple, uh, simple explanation of what's going on and how thermal uh, isotropic analogies universe look like. And I, I strongly suggest that you read. But the goal, but the Friedman equation again is a pi g over three times the energy density, which I'm not going to write some numbers times some effective number of degrees of freedom times the temperature to the fourth. So now the time scale, the age of the universe, there's only one dimensionful parameter that describes uh, the universe, which is age. So it's not a surprise that in a radiation universe, radiation uh, dominated universe, the time, the age of the universe is roughly h to the minus one, with a factor of half here. So this equation relates the time to the temperature. And again, this is very intuitive. The temperature drops as the universe expands. We get less dense, and if we get less dense, the temperature is lower. So as the universe expands, the, te the temperature lowers, and therefore we can think about time and temperature. It's really the same thing, that the relation, the relation goes through the hardware. 
Okay? So we define our time um, variable to be n chi divided by the temperature. Okay, so if the temperature drops, if we time evolves, the temperature drops, they become larger. Okay? And again, it's a dimensionless parameter. So you do the uh, you do the math and you use these equations and you use these variables and you get from this equation the following the z over y equality a equilibrium sorry dy to the z equals minus sigma v at a chi. Divided by H times Y chi squared over Y chi equilibrium squared minus one. So so exercise number two is Derived theta. Okay, this is trivial, it's just a chain of values. And you the Friedman equation. Alright, so from this long Boltzmann equation we wrote at the very beginning, this is what we end up with. So let's try and understand what this means. There are two limits that we can try to understand this. When sigma v times n equilibrium, n chi equilibrium, is much larger than h, what happens? n sigma v is just the rate of interaction, it's the number density of chi times the, uh, the cross section, this has a, a unit of rate, and this is what we call gamma, gamma chi, the rate of annihilation. When this is much larger than the rate of expansion, then this is very large, and therefore this tends to go to zero dynamically. So we get that y chi goes to y chi equilibrium. So in the limit, then the rate, the, the rate of annihilation is much larger than the rate of expansion. Y follows the equilibrium value. Precisely as we anticipated from the very beginning. If the rate is fast enough, it's going to take equilibrium. <coughs> when sigma v and chi equilibrium is much smaller than h, then this goes to zero, and therefore y becomes constant. Okay? So y chi goes to some constant. What does this constant depend on? It only depends on when this happens, and it depends on the cross section. Okay? So whenever we become constant, but which constant? depends on this cross section. So what is the picture? So the picture is the following. We have Z, which I remind you is the time, and we have Y. And Y equilibrium is just this exponential form. Right, so this is y equilibrium. And as long as this cross section is larger than the Hubble, the dark matter is going to follow it. But at some point, it's going to get out of thermal equilibrium, freeze out, and therefore it will become constant. Remember why it's constant after it freezes out, because there's no the, the effect of volume is eliminated by this ratio. So why is going to be constant? 
And if the cross section is uh, uh, larger, we're going to get out of equilibrium at a later stage. So as we increase it will be. As we increase sigma v, we are going to, be, to remain with less and less dark matter particles. And that's just the answer. Again, the intuitive answer, but also the answer to this equation. Okay? okay, so now let's, let's uh, try to solve this equation heuristically. So you write a rough answer to what is one as a function of the Okay? So from this we learn that three out occurs when gamma is called, which is n now equilibrium sigma t equals h. So if we just ask what is the number density here, we would roughly get the answer, the right answer. So we need to know what is the number density when chi equals h. And gamma equals h. Alright, so roughly, we're gonna do it roughly, but we can do it more precisely as well. So the number density is just G times mt mt of the bar to the three halves e to the minus n over t. So I'm assuming already that it freezes out when the energy is smaller than the temperature. Yeah, the energy is smaller than the mass. Namely, it freezes out when its uh, uh, number density is exponentially small. Right? It's not t cubed. It's this exponential. Suppression, this is in the limit of t much smaller than n. We will see in a second when is this consistent, but let's assume that for a second. So, in terms of z, this is roughly, right, um, z to the three halves times m cubed e to the minus z. h is some number times t squared over n plus. So G Newton that I wrote in there, let me remind you again, this is A pi G over 3, G is 1 over n plus squared, the Newton constant is just 1 over n plus squared, <coughs> times the energy density which is equal to the force. So H is roughly T squared over n plus, okay? Which is just uh, some number times n squared over n plus times C to the minus 2. Okay. All right, and then and one more step is to assume so the cross section. I, I didn't mention this before, but the reason this thing drops out of thermal equilibrium is because both the number density, which depends depend on temperature, and the cross section in principle depends on temperature. And of course, the Hubble they depend differently on temperature, the left and the right hand side. So, as the temperature changes, at some point, they're going to cross each other. So, I'm going to uh, uh, expand the thermally average cross section as some cross section times z to the minus n. Okay, so I'm assuming that the leading order term is proportional to z to the minus n. n equals 0 is called the s wave annihilation, n equals 1 is called the g wave annihilation, and so on. Okay. And then I, plug, I just plug it all in. So I'm going to have some uh, z to the minus n plus 3 halves e to the minus z equals some z to the minus 2. I compare the two, and what I get is that at freeze out, yes, at freeze out, my zf is roughly log of uh, some numbers, I intentionally don't write them down, times n plan sigma naught n chi, which is a volt of 25. 
So it frees out. This number is roughly 25. Okay? Depending, of course, on sigma and n, but this rough number, if it's larger than 1, then our assumption that we froze out when cold, when we were uh, non-relativistic, is correct. Okay? So our assumption was that z is larger than 1, and for a low, large range of values of sigma naught and n, this is indeed true. So if you want for T, V, scale, dark matter, in the cross section that I mentioned in a second, this is roughly 25. And the key point to, to see here is that we are only logarithmically sensitive to what is the mass and what is the cross section. And for, which is why for a very large uh, range of values, we get this uh, freeze out, cold freeze out, namely the dark matter freezes out when it's not relativistic. Okay, we can, we can continue. So we extracted the freeze-out temperature, but uh, we still want to know what is the number density of Kali at freeze-out and today. So we can just divide, we know what H is, we can divide by sigma V. So N Kali freeze-out is just H over sigma V. Okay? And uh, by the way, you should, you should uh, convince yourself that for roughly, for z equals 25, this corresponds to a velocity of roughly one third of the speed of light. Okay? So do the exercise. Uh, so, no. The kinetic energy is roughly three times the uh, uh, 3kt, and therefore you can extract, given the temperature, you can extract the average velocity, the velocity turns out to be one third of the uh, speed of light. Okay. okay, so the number density again I can plug in, now H freeze out, is the H at T equals T freeze out, and again at T Freeze out, and we roll down sigma v here, and we roll down h here. We can just plug in the numbers. So let me uh, tell you what the answer is. <coughs> and well, okay. Well, I don't need to say more than that. Just these values when we take z or z freeze out. But now we want to know not what the number density was. And freeze out, we want to know the number density today of dark matter. So we do need one more step. And the easiest thing is to actually use the, the y, which is just the range. Okay, so this is constant. So y at freeze out equals y of chi today, and therefore n chi today is just n chi freeze out times s today over s freeze out. The entropy density today, which we measure, over the entropy density So we plug in the numbers and now let me give you what it actually is. So G star is the effective number of degree of freedom that go into uh, the energy density. G star S is the effective number of degrees of freedom that go into the entropy. And this is times Z freeze out to the N plus 1 times S not the entropy today divided by n chi sigma naught n chi. Okay? So does it just algebra? It's literally uh, taking this value that we plug in here, plug it in the entropy, recalling that the entropy uh, at freeze out goes at the temperature cube at freeze out. Okay? So the entropy goes at the temperature, and therefore we find what is the number that's it in today. And in particular, y chi today is proportional 
to 1 over n chi sigma naught. So we solve the Bolton equation by making the approximation that we solve the hydraulic edge freeze out to extract the number density edge freeze out, and we evolve it <coughs> today. The evolution to today is simple, and the uh, extraction of the number density is also simple because we use the freeze out approximation. So what are the conclusions? Also, okay, so we conclude So first of all, as we said before, the final abundance depends only on sigma naught and there is of course the freeze out temperature, which depends only weakly on both the mass and sigma naught. So, at least in order, we only care about sigma naught, and the freeze out temperature actually over equally depends on n chi. So, only logarithmic dependence on n chi. Okay. Um, the mechanism that we saw, because we at a very early universe, we just follow the Boltzmann distribution, the thermal distribution, we are very weakly, uh, we don't depend on any initial condition. If we start with any initial condition we want for the dark matter, because, of, because it thermalizes early on, we are no longer uh, sensitive to whatever initial condition we started with. So this is the so-called I have uh, dependence, infrared dependence. So we only care about the infrared uh, properties of this dark matter, maybe how it interacts with the with our visible sector at low energy. And we are in completely it is completely independent of the uh, evolution or whatever happens at the UV at the high energy scale. Now you can ask what is the, um, what is, I mean, we solved it, we found y is a function of all, of our single parameter. What is this parameter, what does this parameter need to be in order to get the right abundance today? So we can just plug in the numbers. And For dark matter of order 100 GeV, we find that sigma naught is of order 3 times 10 to the minus 26 centimeters cubed per second. Sigma V. Okay? So this is the, an this is the answer. It's actually sigma v for n equals zero, and it's slightly uh, smaller for uh, sorry, slightly larger for uh, n equals one for b-wave emulation. But it doesn't matter. It's of order <coughs> three times ten to the minus twenty-six in order uh, to get the right values. So why are we excited about this? One of the main issues is this: we are it's a very very simple model, single parameter sigma. Tells us, uh, predicts for us what is the dark matter, but this number looks completely arbitrary. So let's now, in the rest of in the next 10 minutes, try to understand what this number means. And why we are really so excited about this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, freeze out mechanism to produce dark matter. So before that, exercise number three. So exercise number three derives the equivalent. And equality for hot decoupling. Namely, what is the density, number density when we decouple? 
uh, when the whole trading decouples, not when we decouple with this exponential suppression. And what is the limit on M for the whole trading? In order to not overclose the universe. So if we just demand, we say we need a, we want that we had a hot trade to couple when it was hot, when it was relativistic, what is the limit such that this uh, particle does not overclose the universe? I mean, its density today is not larger than the density that we measure to make the universe, uh, uh, that makes the universe flat. So, um, overclock the universe. This is the so called uh, uh, Cosby McLaren bound. In particular, for the neutrino, find out what is the limit of the mass of the neutrino in order to get. And not over to the universe, and what is the mass of the neutrinos such that we can write the okay. So people thought at first that maybe the neutrinos can explain that matter, but if you do this exercise, you see why this doesn't move. One reason that this doesn't move. Alright, so. Again, let's try and understand this number, and this goes under the title Weekly Big Miracle. Weak because we'll see this type of particle that has this cross section is uh, roughly is weakly interacting. So weak is a weakly interacting massive particle. And let's try and understand what is the miracle here. So we don't have much time. All right. So recall that radiation particles, which are relativistic, like photons, the density of radiation is roughly goes like t to the fourth, which is the energy density. Only, only they mention there the mass of particles. Only they mention the temperature. So the energy density, as they mentioned four, and therefore we have to go like t to the fourth. Okay, and then there's a g star. Here, the number of degrees of freedom, effective number of degrees of freedom. And what is the density of matter? Matter goes like a T cubed. We saw that before. Um, so the energy density of matter is omega m, the thing we measure today, times rho criti rho critical. Right? This is the definition. But as a function of, uh, uh, of temperature, it evolves like 40. And therefore, it goes like t over t today q. Okay. So radiation goes like t to the fourth. Matter goes like t q. This is exactly the fact of the three that we saw in the Boltzmann equation. It's the dilution due to the same. So we can ask when, given that we've measured today what is the matter density and the radiation density, we can ask at what time will the radiation and matter be the same? This is called the equality time. Okay, so T equality, if you write it down, is an um, order one number, which we don't care about, I don't want to write it down precisely, times omega matter rho C divided by S naught. Okay, that's the temperature, when I compare this to this, I get some temperature, which is the answer, and if I plug that in, that is roughly, 1.5 EV. Okay. So this is the time of equality between radiation and matter. So you'll understand in a second why, so you have to bear with me. I know you don't understand why I'm doing this, but what I want to show you is some way to understand this number. Okay. There, is, there is some time in the universe, the universe which only depends on our measurement of the radiation and matter that we measure. And uh, this is called the equality time, and it's one and a half EV. 
when the temperature was one and a half degrees, roughly. Meanwhile, we have omega chi squared, which is what? It is just y chi times s naught. This is the number density of chi, so y chi today times the entropy today. This gives us the number density of dark matter. If we multiply by the dark matter mass, this gives us the energy density. Recall that dark matter is non relativistic, so its energy is just the mass. So for every particle of dark matter, we have times the energy gives us the energy density. The energy is just the mass of the dark matter. So this is the energy density. And of course, we need to divide by the OC, which is minus 2, the H is just a constant. So this is, this is the relation between what we measure dark matter to be and what it is having computed it. And this needs to be exactly what we measure lambda CDN to be, namely how much dark matter we measure in the universe. This is lambda CDN that we mentioned before, it's roughly 0.1. Okay. So we can plug in the result we found before. We can plug in the result we found before for y, y0. So let me remind you, y0 suggests um, Okay, anyways, y0 is just 1 over n chi sigma naught n plan. And therefore, we can just plug it back in. And we're going to get, when I plug it back in, is that one more step. You see that s over rho goes like t equal to t over lambda matter. So I can plug in s over rho. And I'm going to get, for that, omega matter over t equal to t. So instead of this, just plug in roughly omega matter over t equal to t. And so we're going to get an equation. We plug this in here as well. And we're getting the equation that m chi, well, m chi, before we plug this in, n chi times y chi needs to equal some omega cdn times form critical divided by s naught, which is, this is just this, which is some number times d equal. And this number is just roughly speaking omega cdn over, over omega matter. So omega of the dark matter of the omega matter. This is roughly one as long as dark matter dominates. So the statement that the dark matter dominates implies that the condition for dark matter to be to have the right abundance is that n <coughs> times its y needs to equal order one. This turns out to be roughly 425. So roughly in order one number times the equality temperature. Equality temperature has nothing to do with anything else we've discussed, it's just the temperature where radiation and matter were uh, the same. Okay? So, this is a very useful equation. Usually, if we have some ready uh, uh, particle and we want to make sure that it does not close the universe, this is what you need to compute. Only instead of equal, there needs to be a smaller or equal. So, as long as this number density is smaller than the, the equality temperature, this particle will not dominate the universe, and equality happens if we are uh, the dark matter. Okay? So that's the statement uh, uh, for any ready particle in our universe. And now we plug in this y, okay? and we're going to get what? We're going to get that m dark matter, and then we plug one more thing, I'm going to take sigma naught, to be roughly some effective coupling divided by the dark matter mass squared. So this is just a dimensional analysis. There is some coupling and the mass scale, which is the dark matter mass scale. Two minutes in the dark. So I'm going to plug this in. Okay? And if I plug it back in, I'm going to get the following. It's a very interesting bound. It's m chi needs to be needs to be equal 
alpha times n plan times equal equal. So again, what I'm doing is algebra here. I'm plugging this, and I'm assuming that the cross section has some uh, coupling divided by the only mass scale that I know, which is the dark matter mass. If I do that, I find that the mass of the dark matter needs to equal the geometric mean of two completely uh, uh, independent scales, the Planck scale and the equality time. And this roughly for alpha equals then the minus two or so, uh, fine tuning, the, the, the fine structure constant, for instance, we roughly get the piece in the So there are different masses of the Planck scale here. There's T equality here, at 1 EV, another scale at 10 to the 19 EV, 10 GV, and somehow the geometric average is right at the TV scale. Okay? That's the wind miracle. It's the statement that we have two completely independent scales that somehow uh, come up to be to give us an additional scale where we think we understand for the reasons that David mentioned this morning, we think we understand the physics anyway. So because of the fine tuning, we think that there's gonna be new, new physics here at the TV scale, and it just so happens that if we take these particles uh, that we expect of the lightest stable particles that we expect for the fine tuning, we're gonna get the right abundance, the right dark matter abundance. So all these uh, solutions to the fine tuning problem, or many of these theories that solve the fine tuning problem that David explained in the morning, give us a dark matter candidate with the right abundance if the way it was produced is through thermal uh, free time. Okay. This is the wind miracle, and this is really the reason why everyone are excited about wind. And I can't almost stress this for the last 30 years, what we've been doing is to, uh, by and large, of course, study theories of wind and search for winds. So if we go through the experimental problem, which we read, we will see that most of the experimental directions that we do in the last uh, 30 years were to search for winds. Given that we don't see uh, anything in the LMC, given that we don't see right now solutions, winds are, are absolutely an uh, exciting solution and the most likely one still. And yet, given that we don't see, you should go and question whether you really believe that this is the answer and what are the assumptions that we made and what other possibilities do we have. So we spend a lot and lot of time and a huge amount of effort in that, and the reason is precisely this, the wind miracle. We have a solution to the fine tuning problem that can try to give us the exact same scale that is two uh, independent uh, scales, the plant scale and the equality scale. Alright, so we'll continue with different production mechanisms. 